All right, here we go. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to City Club Missoula's August Forum, a first for us at Western Montana Congressional Candidates Town Hall. My name is Brett Rosenberg, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as chair of City Club Missoula's Board of Director. And I'm so glad to see the packed house we have here today. Another first for us, I think. Um, as you know, City Club's mission is to bring people together to inform and inspire on issues vital to the community through public forums that encourage the discussion of new ideas and the free exchange of thought. We have a deep commitment to civility and civil discourse even when we discuss challenging and controversial issues. We can listen respectfully and disagree without being disagreeable. Before I introduce our moderators, some thank yous are in order. Thank you to Missoula Community Access Television, which, which records our forums as part of their media assistance grants to nonprofit organizations. MCAT serves our community on cable channels 189 and 190 and is live streaming right now via their local live platform. You can also find videos of past City Club Missoula forums by clicking the video button on our website, cityclubmissoula.com. Thank you to our sponsors, in particular those at the executive level. Those are the University of Montana, Blackfoot Communications, and First Security Bank. Our executive level sponsors are key partners in helping us plan our forums, expand our audience, and, and provi provide reliable access to each one of these things. We are also grateful to our other sponsors, and we invite you to join them by going to our website. And of course, thanks to our board of directors and our administrator, Danny Hallett, with whom we could not pull off any of this. Um, City Club Missoula would also like to acknowledge that we are in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people, some of whom I hope are present with us today at this forum. Today we honor the path they have always shown us in caring for this place for the generations to come. All right, time to introduce our moderator, Sally Mock. Retired in 2014, but still a presence on Montana Public Radio, Sally Mock is a University of Kansas graduate, as am I. <laughs> Just saying. Um, yeah, a former Wilderness Ranger, who has reported on everything from the legislature to forest fires. She also taught broadcast writing and reporting in the University of Montana Journalism School. Sally is the host of Capital Talk and Campaign Beat. And Sally will introduce our, our candidates and generally keep the forum running on time. I will pop back up here at 11.25 or so to explain the question and answer portion of the forum. Thank you, Brett, and uh, this is a little bit uh, odd for me because I've been mostly retired for a while, so it feels like I'm back in the saddle right now. Uh, and I'm going to give very brief introductions of our candidates because I think they will use their opening statements to do some bragging about themselves, so I'll let them do that. And I'll start on the very end here with uh, libertarian John Lamb. John is a farmer. He was born in Florida, and he now lives in Norris, Montana. He's never held political office, but he ran unsuccessfully for the state senate. Um, and Mr. Zinke was born in Bozeman. He's Republican, raised in Whitefish as a former Navy SEAL, who ran unsuccessfully for lieutenant governor, served two terms in the state senate, served in the U.S. House for two years before being appointed Secretary of the Interior, a post he also held for two years. And then we have Monica Trinnell, the Democrat, born and raised in eastern Montana, has never held political office, but ran twice unsuccessfully for a seat on the State Public Service Commission, first as a Republican and then as a Democrat. And she competed as a rower in two Olympics. And she's currently an attorney in Missoula. And I think uh, we'll start with opening statements from Mr. Lamb. So, OK. You'll get a mic. Thanks for having me. It, uh, it's an honor to be here today. Um, I live near Bozeman, Montana, in a little town called Norris. Um, it's barely on the map. but I. <laughs> live there with my wife and 12 children and a little farm and uh, I have a couple of businesses out of Bozeman. I have a greenhouse business and uh, a recycling company. Uh, politics has always been very uh, passionate for me as even a young kid growing up. Uh, I, I was born in Florida but I really never lived in Florida. I grew up in Indiana uh, on a farm there and um, we always in our 
religious and our faith and growing up and things always had politics and it seems like government overreach uh, controlling everything we've done from our farming, from uh, our faith, our religion, our church, and it made an impact on me growing up and I've always had a desire to change things and um, so the, two years ago I ran for state senate, I did not win. But um, I'm going to continue this fight for freedom and liberty, and this is my uh, dream and my goal to sometimes, sometimes be in office to, to um, bring some of that liberty back to the people. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the audience would like the candidates to stand when they speak, so sorry about that, Mr. Lane. We'll catch you next time. Okay. Of course. Well, for those who don't know me, uh, Ryan Zinke. So I'm fifth generation Montanan. My grandfather helped build the Fort Peck Dam. My grandmother was a one room school teacher outside of Ritchie. Uh, I was born in Bozeman and my folks were going to school, so I'm a mini bobcat, sorry. And then I uh, went to high school in Whitefish. That's where my, most of my experience uh, growing up was. I was Played state championship football. Whitefish was pretty good when I, when I graduated. Played college football at Oregon and then became a Navy SEAL. In the SEALs, I spent two, tur two tours at SEAL Team 6 and commanded the most elite forces in the face of the planet. I also was the deputy and acting commander of special forces in Iraq. And a lot of what my view on energy comes from that experience. After I retired from the military in 2008, my wife of 30 years and I decided to raise our kids as bulldogs. So we went back to Whitefish. My oldest son's a bulldog. My youngest son's a bulldog. I'm a bulldog. My dad's a bulldog. And my mom's a bulldog. So we're a bulldog family. After I uh, did a little time uh, coaching football at Whitefish, and then I uh, decided to run for state uh, senate, was senate for four years, and then ran for Congress. Uh, which is interesting. So I was elected twice, and then I became Secretary of Interior. And people ask me why Secretary of Interior. I don't think there's a department that affects Montana more than Department of Interior. Uh, Montana is affected by Bureau of Reclamation, Bureau of Indian Affairs, our public lands, 20% of the nation's public lands is under Interior. In Montana, public lands, even the Forest Service, when you think about it, surface is Department of Ag, subsurface is all Department of, of Interior. We have BLM, we have monuments, and Montana is affected by Department of Interior. That's why the two things that I focused on as Interior was one, energy independence, and look, when I came in as Secretary, we were 8.3 million barrels a day and declining. After two short years, we were 12.5 million barrels a day, the world's largest exporter of energy. And oh, by the way, we lowered emissions, overall emissions, and we had the best safety record in the history of this country. And on the environmental side, I got fed up with watching our forests burn down, as we all do. I got tired of listening to every superintendent out there saying the parks and our forests are falling apart. So I was the architect behind the Great American Outdoors Act. It was a difficult process to get that through, but it was bipartisan. And it ended up being the biggest investment in our public lands, our forests, and our parks in the nation's history. Now, why am I running? Like you, I see this country in trouble. And it is in trouble. Okay, Mr. Zinke, if you could uh, wrap yep. it up. Okay. And so I'm asking you for support. I believe this country is fixable, and I believe is also defending Montana values because if this country falls, Montana values, and Montana falls with it. So with that, thank you. Thank you, City Club. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, John Lamb, for agreeing to 16 more debates in every county and two on each reservation. I grew up in eastern Montana with my nine brothers and sisters. You got us by two. Some of them are back here in the room today. Thank you for being here. I have been on the trail campaigning for this new district for the last 15 months. I've put thousands, tens of thousands of miles on my minivan, gone through two sets of tires, a set of brakes, and here's what I've heard from you, the people of this new district. In Columbia Falls, the veterans told me about the importance of the PACT Act. 
And we launched Veterans on the Trail with Trinnell, while my opponents stayed silent. In Flathead County, I met with the maintenance of way workers who have had, they maintain the railroad tracks across northern Montana. They've had their wages and pensions cut. They've had to give up their right and control over their schedule. When I left them, I said, what do you love most about your job? And they looked at me and said, the Empire Builder. The Empire Builder is what you, Ryan, voted to cut funding for and cut hurting the workers of Flathead County. In Lake County, I celebrated the transfer of the bison range to the tribes, something you, Ryan, stopped while you were at the interior. In Butte, $500 million of solar panels are coming to a county that has a tax base of a billion dollars. In Butte, I toured the industrial park. New energy project of a billion dollars coming to that county. These are energy resources you've spent your career voting against and trying to kill. In Anaconda and Deer Lodge, I talked to people about the high cost of prescription drugs, and this is something the Inflation Reduction Act will help. Gallatin County is facing unprecedented growth at a time that their elementary schools are being reduced. In Missoula County and all over this district, I'm hearing about the high cost of housing. Across this new district, which is an incredible opportunity for us to send our Montana voice to Congress to work for us, I am hearing from you that you want community and fairness. You want our small businesses to be able to afford to hire workers who can live here and put their kids in our schools. You want our teachers and law enforcement and our nurses to be able to afford houses in our communities. I will work for Montana because I know Montana. And you all have a clear, stark choice between the three candidates running for this office now. Ryan Zinke has spent his career on the payroll of big corporations who have raised our energy rates and we pay more at the pump every time we fill up our cards because of Ryan Zinke's big energy corporate donors. Thank in you. contrast, thank, thank you, Mr. I've thank spent you, Mr. my Mr. career here thank you, thank in Montana you. working for you. I will serve you, thank you. because All I right. know you, and this is my home. Thank you. These are opening statements, and you'll have plenty of opportunity to get your, your uh, comments in. Well, we're off and running. <laughs> <laughs> So much for civility. Uh, okay. We're talking about okay. Trip. okay. We're candidates. Talking about trip. All right. Um, I get to ask the first question of the candidates, and uh, while well, you all think of the wonderful questions you're going to have, and so we'll do that uh, right now. And uh, to set my question up, I want to to make a statement that I hope we all agree with, and that is that a functioning democracy depends upon its citizens agreeing about basic facts and truths. The earth is round, the sky is blue. But we're in an age where that agreement is harder and harder to come by, and that inability to agree about basic facts clearly threatens our democracy. So I have a two-part question. What are your primary sources of trustworthy information? And if elected, what will you do to foster getting information to the public that they can trust? And how will you do that? In other words, how will you foster agreement among Montanans about what is true and what is not? Mr. Zinke, why don't we go with you first? Well, as a commander in the SEAL teams, I never learned much from the headquarters. I didn't learn much from the headquarters as interior either. If you want to find out what's going on, you go to the front line. The front line are, are the people that look at everything, that live day to day, and have to face what Washington, D.C. does. Facts are facts. Now, national news, Wall Street Journal's pretty good, but I, like you, I don't look at one source. I go through the gamut of sources, and I don't think big media is especially on the conservative side. Uh, matter of fact, I would say they're not. But like the 
Inflation Reduction Act that was just said that it would, it would lower medical costs. Well, Wall Street Journal has an article today about it. It will raise costs if you have private insurance for 220 million Americans. Now, it's Wall Street Journal, you can take it as a fact. But I think when you look at Montana, we're a little different. We drive further distances. Inflation hurts us more than it hurts someone else that has the ability for, for those things. So you, you look at where, where truth is, I think we should have a dialogue. Also, I think the anger in our country is distracting us from getting things done. We're Montanans. Certainly we can sit down and we can have a dialogue and, and move to a conclusion where it makes things better. If we can't sit down as Americans and discuss our problems, then those problems will never get solved. I'm a military officer. I've never looked through life through a blue or red lens. It's been red, white, and blue to me. In Montana, I don't care whether you're from Cleveland or Florida, if you're here and you're a part of the community, you're a Montana. And I hope you understand what that obligation is because our lifestyle is worth defending. Okay, Mr. Zinke, thank you. Your time is up. And, and Ms. Chanel. Yeah. So the question is, where do I get information and how do I share information with you? And I will tell you that I've been doing that for the last 15 months on the trail. I've gone to your doors. I've knocked on your doors and I've said, what do you care about? And I've had people tell me across this district, I want to be able to pay for my hearing aids. I want to be able to see. I want to be able to go to the dentist and pay for those things. But one of the things that I think is really most important is who do we trust? And across this district over the last year of campaigning, I've had people tell me after a long conversation, and I've gone to talk to the Ravalli County Commissioners, I've gone to talk to the Flathead County Commissioners, the Lake County Commissioners, the County Commissioners here in Missoula, because it's really important to actually do the things and talk to each other, and I've been doing that. And what I've heard over and over is people say, I agree with you, I don't know who to trust. And that is what we can work on together. So how will I go about sharing information with you on which I will be making my decisions and my votes for us? I will share information with you by showing up, by talking to you, by holding town halls, by going to the counties, to the tribal, to the reservations, as I have been doing for the last 15 months on the trail. So it's with you together that we will figure out what we can rely on and what we can trust. And let me just tell you a story. So we've heard a lot about our libraries, our Board of Health. These have become really divisive places, even though they're sort of the heartbeat of our communities. Our schools have become a source of division. That's not right. So I met with some people in one of the towns, and they said, you know, I just, I don't want to go to the library and see graphic images of inappropriate behavior. And I said, I don't, I don't want to see that either. Let's go over to the library together and see what's actually there. And there's nothing there. So I think okay, it's Mr. important Nell. to do this together. Thank you. Time's up. Yep. Where I get my information from is from the people, my constituents throughout the state and throughout my county and home area. When I see my fellow Montanans suffering from not being able to pay their rent in Bozeman and have to move out. When I see um, businesses closing all over, um, you know, our answer isn't government, it isn't bigger government, but it's our communities and our people that should be helping our fellow Montanans and stuff and trying to work with them. So that's where I get my information from, is from the people and uh, not from the government. You each get a one-minute rebuttal if you'd like to take advantage of that. Anybody? Okay. Right. So just to follow up on, on the importance of information, let's just be clear because I think this isn't a time to be to, of despair. This is a time of hope. And if we look at Montana's history, and we know, and I see our last representative from this district, Pat Williams, is here today. 
Butte, Montana had three newspapers, each one of which was owned by one of the Copper Kings, Marcus Daly, William Clark, and Augustus Heinze. Each one of them was very invested in paying for information that often wasn't true. So Elon Musk is nothing new. What we are facing today is nothing new. What's important is not just talking to each other because sometimes the information we have isn't right. It's coming to consensus together and working through differences together and understanding that sometimes compromise does actually result in the best outcome for us. So coming together, working together, and trusting each other trusting that we all want the best for Western Montana, for this new district, which I look forward to serving you with respect, with pride, with dignity, and I will make Montana proud to have our representative in Congress again. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I just want to highlight on, on our media. So where do most Americans get their media from? Right, Fox News is probably around six million. CNN is down to around four hundred thousand, perhaps. So, where does the other three hundred and fifty million Americans get most of their news? They get it from Facebook, from social media platforms, almost all emanating from San Francisco, and it is. It's censored. Uh, it's manipulated at times, but we should be cautious when too much power and too much thought is held in too little hands, then that becomes an issue. And let me give you an example. Vaccinations, all right? If you even dared to say, what about me? What about natural immunity? Does this jab affect the current virus? What would happen? One com in some cases you were censored, deplatformed. If you were a medical physician, your license could be in jeopardy. Okay, Mr. Zinke, And if time you were a Navy up. SEAL, you could be discharged for service. That's okay. fascism when too much information is held by too right. little Thank hands. you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. I'll be back later when you guys have more questions for them. Thanks. perhaps the moment we've all been waiting for questions and answers. Um, most of you are regulars know the drill here. Uh, we have a lot of familiar or unfamiliar faces though, and so I'll explain the process of what we call table talk, which is a, probably the richest part of a typical city club forum. We will take seven minutes for people at every table to come up and agree with each other on a question to ask the candidates. The candidates will have two minutes to ask to, or to answer each question with one minute to rebut. Sally will moderate that process. Um, after seven minutes, two volunteers from City Club will come around with microphones for a volunteer from each table to ask your question. And that's basically it. As I said at the beginning of the, the uh, forum, we take respect and civility very seriously here and expect as much from everyone in the audience, and uh, please avoid rambling statements and things of that nature, and keep your questions brief so we can get as many as we can. Um, our seven minute timer begins now, so have at it. Thank you. If the candidates would like coffee or cookies or something, a rest. All right, please wrap it up. We're gonna get going again here in a second. Um, As I mentioned, we'll have a couple people with microphones going from table to table. We'll try to get to as many tables as we possibly can. Unfortunately, the format and the hard stop at 1230 will prevent us from getting to every one of you, so I apologize for that, but we're doing the best we can with what we have. Um, please ask your question quickly. Uh, if you don't mind, please introduce yourself when you do so. Each candidate will have, you can ask your question to all or any of the candidates. Each candidate will have two minutes to respond and one minute to rebut. Sally will maintain order up here. So um, I don't see them, but the mic, there's one microphone person there on that side of the room and another over here. So here we go. Cool. I'm gonna hold on to 
My name is Jana Staten, and our table agrees that the question we most want to ask is will you honor the right to privacy in the Montana Constitution, which is now under threat, and vote against a federal ban on abortion if it comes before the next Congress? I think uh, we'll start with Mr. Lamb and just go down the row here. Okay. That's a great question. I appreciate that question. As uh, you may have heard, I have 12 children. So abortion is um, something that I've been totally against my whole life. It's a part of my moral and religious background. So I would definitely vote against abortion. Um, so and I, I, for the federal government, I don't believe the federal government should be involved in our life. I'm, I'm for a more of a state and local um, government, not a not a federal government, but uh, I would definitely vote against abortion. Okay, Mr. Zinke. So I'm pro-life, but life is not perfect, is it? Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have any unwanted pregnancies? Wouldn't it be nice if there wasn't incest, rape, issues of health of the mother or child? Wouldn't it be nice? But it's not true, is it? So I think a ban is too harsh, but I can tell you open-ended, as my opponent and as the Democratic Party would suggest and support, I'm sorry, I do not agree with termination moments before birth. And, you, and, and privacy has limits. Right. Yeah. The more audience response we have, the less time we have for candidates to speak. So let's try to keep that to a minimum. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jana, for your question. And since we will be in the majority after the midterms, I will go you one step further and say that I will vote uh, for women's rights to live life on our own terms and to be able to choose how, when, and whether we become parents. Let's be... Let's be clear about what is happening here. We know how to reduce unwanted pregnancies. And in the years that my opponent was in the state legislature in a majority, in federal Congress in majority, they did nothing to help our families. They did nothing for contraceptive care. Anybody here know how much it costs to get an IUD? $1,000, plus a very painful procedure. Anybody know how much it costs to be on the pill? Do you guys know? You have, to get a, you have to get a doctor's prescription. You have to go to the doctor, get an annual prescription, and it's 50 bucks a month. That is what we can and must change. We know how to reduce unwanted pregnancies, and what have the Republicans done to make that happen? Nothing. So I will support a woman's right unequivocally, a woman's right to live life on our own terms. And let's be clear about the extremism of the positions of my opponents. They would not save a woman's life when she is at risk of dying because she's pregnant. And that would leave children without a mother. They would not support an abortion of a 10-year-old who is raped. That is wrong. We need to focus on our communities, on our families. What are we doing for childcare? You were the secretary of the Committee on Education at the state legislature. What, you, what did you do for pre-K education? Nothing. We can do better by our families. We can make it possible okay. for families to have, to choose to have the children that they want. Your time and is I will up, support Mr. that. Nell. Thank you. All right. Candidates get uh, one minute rebuttal. Well, there's a contrast. Open it anytime, anywhere, any place without remorse. That's murder. It's murder. All right. And the other side is when I when I voted, I believe in in providing, make sure that we get ahead of the problem so we don't have it. So yeah, when I was in the state legislature, I did defend a woman's right for birth control, and I do. And because I, because I'm a father. I'm also a husband, and within our family, we understand the issue. But I do agree, once again, that I think it's too harsh to, because you, you, we do have incest, rape, 
a lot of things. And I've never, ever voted against a woman's right to make sure she saves herself, right, on these medical conditions. So, truth, this is truth. I, ha I have a, a three-year-old son back here. He was born at about four pounds. And um, the doctors, well, some doctors anyway, would have said to save my wife's life to abort that little baby. Um, my wife's life is very important. Every life is important to me. The baby in the womb and the mother is both important. The doctor saved both lives. We didn't have to abort that little baby to save my wife's life. We have great medical doctors today that um, can save lives, both lives. And that's what we did. We choose the right way to go. And so I don't believe abortion in this day and time is necessary. We can save both lives. So let's be clear about where the extremism of my, both of my opponents' positions would leave us. Women would be at risk of dying, and we know what we're seeing right now. We are seeing this across the country, where a woman at 22 weeks pregnant and the baby doesn't have a skull and is inconsistent and incompatible with the mother's life, but she can't get an abortion. That is not something that is good for any community. It's not something that's good for us as a country. So we need to be clear about also this, this like crazy talk about, oh, murdering somebody moments before birth. That is just absolutely crazy. Would you put a woman in jail for having a miscarriage? That's where you are. And that's not right. So let's talk about what we actually need to be doing for our communities. Let's support young families and women have the right to participate in the world on our own terms. This decision is the first time in our okay. history Your where freedoms up, have Mr. been taken Nell. away. Thank you. I will vote to give them back. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I just uh, would like to say that there's been some heckling and from the audience, and I think that's really unnecessary. These are emotional issues, certainly, and we all feel strongly about them. But uh, the more we can be respectful, I think the the more we can get information that everybody needs to make a decision that's very important. So please show uh, respect for the speakers and for each other, and try to keep your heckling to uh, zero, if you would, please. Thank you. Thank you. My, my name is Wayne Rusk. I'm candidate for state legislature here in Montana. The question is for all candidates. We are all very concerned about the increase of opioids and meth coming into Montana. How do we stop the flow of these dangerous drugs into our state, reservations, and into the United States at large? Okay. Mr. Zinke, you want to take that? Well, you talked to Adam or, uh, Knudsen, our attorney general, and it's coming from the southern border. It, drugs, sex, sex trafficking, child trafficking is in every city in Montana, including here. So what do we do? We're going to have to shut down the southern border first. And that's, that's not that hard. You can finish the wall where a wall is appropriate and empower the, the Border Patrol to do their job, empower ICE to do their job. But we need to get the drugs out uh, of Montana. And it's coming through. I just talked to the DEA head. In the, in, the, in the district, and it's all coming from the, the southern, and now this is a distribution point. So when I was secretary on the Indian reservations, they're sovereign nations. So we put task force together, we worked with the tribes to go in and, and get the task force from, from the DEA, from everything that, that Interior had, to work with the tribes, and the tribes are across Montana, they're in complete free fall. You know, spend a little time in Browning. They probably lost a half a dozen kids and young, young people probably last month with fentanyl. And fentanyl is deadly. And let me tell you how deadly it is. Is that a Naval Academy, one of the cadets uh, got in trouble, had fentanyl. Two other cadets initiated CPR and were killed. That's how toxic fentanyl is. It is the most dangerous time in our history to be a teenager. The number of fentanyl deaths across the country 
are now the number one killer, and they're here. So we're going to have to shut the southern border down, and we're going to have to empower our law enforcement to eradicate it. And it's going to take education, because normalization of drugs in our schools is causing havoc, and we see it. So this is a, this is a community, state, and federal issue that we're going to have to wrestle the ground because it is devastating our country. Okay. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Wayne, and thank you for being a candidate for office. It's really important that people step up and run, and I appreciate you doing that. The question was, how are we going to address um, addictive drugs and uh, coming into our district? And also, how do we handle the reality of addiction across the district? So first of all, let's talk about how drugs get here. So fentanyl is uniquely a supply side issue, and it is mostly made in China. So correctly solving any problem means correctly diagnosing it, understanding it, and figuring out what is it that's actually happening and fixing that targeted problem. So fentanyl, I've talked to the DEA agents here. I've done ride-alongs with law enforcement across this district, and it is a significant issue where we are, but where it's coming from is not the southern border. It's being made in China, and how it's getting here is a complex series of things that are happening, and shutting down the border is not going to reduce the fentanyl crisis because that is being smuggled in by citizens of the United States. So we need to solve the problem, but we need to figure out what is actually happening first and not demonize and blame things that won't actually fix anything, but are easy talking points and maybe an easy bumper sticker. So what do we do, though? What is the reality of the problem? Because riding along with our law enforcement, it's really, really challenging for them, and I understand it when I'm in with them. And I see it's really hard to tell the good guys from the bad guys anymore. And when you get out and you're in, at risk of being exposed to fentanyl and maybe losing your life because of that, those are real problems. And we need to help our law enforcement in those regards. But I think it really comes back to figuring out how we are going to support our small businesses, how we are going to support our teachers, our nurses, our labor force, so that people can live in the communities where they work, so that we can see each other. Thank and we you. keep Your our eyes on each other. Thank you. And Mr. stop Lynn. the deaths of despair. <clears throat> Thank Lynn. you. Yep. Well, government's not the answer, in my opinion here. Um, the, the government's had a war on drugs for over 40 years now. And where, where are we at now? We, we still got a drug problem. Um, Drugs, I've never, never drank alcohol in my life. I've never done drugs in my life. But um, it's an individual choice. We have to educate people instead of putting people in prison for these things. And so more, more war on drugs, more war on this is not going to fix the drug problem. It's going to be an education issue where we have to educate people in our communities and teach people what's right from wrong, not just a hardcore uh, war on drugs where we're locking more people up. We still have 40,000 people in prison here in the United States for marijuana. And marijuana's now legal in many states, but we're, we're still holding 40,000 prisoners. How many more prisoners do we need for drugs when um, it's, it's, it's the war on drugs isn't working, is what I'm saying. We don't need government. What we need is, is um, more education and teaching our children properly and bringing them up. Thank you. Thank you. I, I agree with, uh, I actually agree with you, John, on many of those points, but I, I think we can't criminalize addiction and we can't criminalize poverty. And we need to understand what's happening and how we solve those problems. But one of the things that we need to address is mental health. And I would support and help enforce the Mental Health Parity Act, which was passed in 2008 and is yet to be meaningfully implemented. So addressing the mental health issues across our district and the Republican Party now is reducing the number of guidance counselors in our schools. We are seeing a crisis at Warm Springs and we are putting people in the streets because of addiction. So criminalizing these issues is not the right, right way to go forward. And I agree with you, John, that we need to figure out how to address people's lives, what's underlying it, and not treating people as criminals 
when there is something else happening that we can, as a society, come together and fix. But I do think that government has to partner with people, and we have to work together to come to solutions for all of us. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Zinke, would you like to? Yep. For anyone to say the southern border isn't a problem in drugs, your head is buried so deep in the sand that you'll never see light. Period. All right, and Monica, you say you're, you help the police, but you're also a counselor, a, a legal counselor and an advisor to Montana 350, which is to fund the police. So you can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. You gotta support our law enforcement and you gotta shut down the border. And I do agree with Monica on mental health. And look at the homeless problem in this town, All right? Look at the homeless problem. You have drug addiction, you have abuse, and you have mental illness. And it's affecting this town. Now, I grew up in Whitefish. I always, I always I'd love to come to, to Missoula and watch a ball game. But this reflection of Missoula is not good with our, with our, with our mental health in the streets. So I agree. This, this, is a, this, is a, this is an American, a Montanan issue when it comes to mental health. It's just not Missoula. You know, there's homelessness in Whitefish. There's homelessness across. But I, I do agree with you that mental health, we need to put resources in there. And in some cases, you can't have people on the streets that are not capable of being on the street. And th this is a societal issue that humanitarians would say, no. We need to help these people, but you need to also okay. help them with okay, the Mr. problems Zinke, they face. That's enough. And thank Mr. You. Lamb, do you want to? No, OK. All right. I request 15 seconds. No, to, no thank you. You misrepresented no. me. Okay. Uh, That's he's, he's it's one minute. One minute I'll rebuttal. I'll do 15 seconds. Uh, Mr. Zinke, I actively support funding our police. Let me be unequivocal and clear. I support funding for our law enforcement and for our police. I have never said anything different. And for you to misrepresent me in front of this crowd does no service to democracy. Thank okay. you. Are you well, Are you legal counsel for Montana 350? Are we, you, Are you, wanna, you wanna have a debate? Let's have a debate. Oh, right. I do represent 350 Montana, and in that capacity, I have reduced your energy costs that 350 has bravely and courageously fought for. Okay. But because I represent one client doesn't mean that I ascribe to everything that that client does. I've had a lot of clients across the last 25 years, okay. and I am proud of the work that I have done here in Montana, and you can see it anywhere. I support funding for our police, and I have worked with 350 to reduce your energy rates, and I'm proud of that work. Okay. Next question here. I just want to remind our candidates that we have a lot of people with a lot of questions, and if we turn this into a lengthy debate on each question, we won't get very many in. So please be respectful of the audience as well. Okay, Sally next here. question. Sally here. Hi, I'm Alan Alt. I'm a candidate for House District 90, and our table's question is directed to Monica. Monica, you have said that you support a, an assault weapons ban and that gun manufacturers should be held legally accountable and if their product is used to kill another human. Do you believe the car company should be held legally accountable for the deranged man who drove a car through a parade and killed people? Okay, Mr. Nell, you want to respond? Oh, sorry. No, it was addressed to you. Alan, thank you for being a candidate for office and for running. That's what uh, democracy is all about, is putting good candidates in front of people so that they can make up their minds. So you've asked me about um, the safety, our, our safety of our communities, and how do we keep our communities safe? And let me tell you this. I grew up on a ranch in eastern Montana. I know and understand the Montana gun culture. I've lived it. I also have a sister who teaches at a, one of the large public high schools in this state, and I understand how important it is for our teachers and our children to be safe. I pose this question to the county commissioners of one of our conservative counties, and they, you know what they said to me? They said, nobody should be able to buy a gun in, in 30 minutes. They, very conservative voters here in Montana, support longer background checks and very conservative voters here across this district support red flag laws 
And I, as a representative of this district, will do the work of the people of this district and support those policies that I have been told by the voters here that they support. Thank you. Well, let me be clear with me. I support and defend the Constitution of the United States, and the Second Amendment is part of that. And the Second Amendment, to me, is non-negotiable, just like the rest of the Constitution is. If you want to change the Constitution, change it. But unless you do, the Constitution stands as written. I, I personally don't carry a gun. I don't like guns. I'm just like uh, on the abortion stance. I couldn't take a life. I, I don't, well, at least I don't want to take a life. So I'm non-resistance in my faith. But the Second Amendment is part of our country and our culture, culture and um, this, this founding of this country. I believe the Second Amendment is very important to have and every individual should have a God-given right to carry a gun, not just a constitutional right. Yeah. Um, so with respect to the Constitution, how many amendments are there, Ryan? Monica, if you want to start this, Do you know? let's go. Do you know? 27. 27 amendments to the Constitution. I support them all. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to respond, Mr. Zinke? Mr. Zinke, would you like to respond? Monica, do you know what the Second Amendment states? Do you? Yes. Say it. Shall not be infringed. What, what's it, what are the first three words? Okay, no, no, we're not going to do this. What are the first three words? Okay, okay, let's get to the next question, please. A well-regulated okay. militia. Okay. Okay. Sue Fury. How can federal policy impact local issues such as housing, child care solutions, and mental health care? All right, Mr. Lamb, you want to go first? I, I, I believe the, it, ever, all this should go back to the local government. I, I, don't, I don't like a federal government being involved in our lives in our state. I believe that we're independent states and we should keep the federal government out of all of this stuff and our state should handle all these issues. I don't like federal funding from the federal government because it comes with strings attached. We need local government, small government, and um, so I'm not for, a, a, for federal funding. Okay, Mr. Zinke. Could I ask you to repeat the question? Thank you. How can federal policy impact local issues such as housing, child care solutions, and mental health care? Yeah, um, federal policy can affect the communities, and in some places it has, it has an enormous role. Um, but the states also have rights. You know, we're, we're a lot different than the other states. So a federal policy, let's say, when on food stamps, that's a federal policy that goes to schools and is distributed. And that's a good program. There's a lot of kids that grew up in Montana, as an example, that don't have a, a good family unit. And in some cases, breakfast, lunch, and after school uh, meals are the only thing they get. So the, f the federal government does have a responsibility, and I think a moral obligation to do that. A lot of issues, though, in Montana are Montana-centric. Water is the U.S. Water is the U.S., in my opinion, is a, a bridge too far from the federal government interference. And well, look, let's, let's talk about our environment. How do you think Washington, D.C. can manage Yellowstone River if they don't know where it is? And they don't know where it is. A lot of Washington, D.C. views Montana through a Yellowstone series with Kevin Costner. And yes, Beth is tough. We agree on that. But you know, the federal government and the state's government, the state government have to work together and, and where there's a collision course, the states should have a say. And as secretary, I worked hard to make sure the decisions from D.C. were pushed as far as I could down to reflect the local community in Montana. So I, I think we should have a voice. And our voice oftentimes isn't heard within the, in the shadows in the, in the halls of D.C. 
So having a federal government is important, and I, agree, and I, I disagree that there's a, there's a purpose and intent in a, in, a, uh, in a mission for the federal government. But a lot of the decision making, as much as we can push the front line from a military perspective and have more of a Montana twist on it and have the flexibility to do that, I think is important. Thank you, Sue, for the question. And I think you asked about federal government working with our local and state jurisdictions on mental health and housing and child care. So let's just take them in order. On mental health, I would support implementation and enforcement of the 2008 Mental Health Parity Act. We need to figure this out. Our communities need to be supported. We're coming out of two years of a pandemic that had a really terrible effect on all of us. We need to come together again as communities and figure out some of the problems with mental health. And that would be my starting point on that, working with our communities. With respect to housing, one of the things that the federal government can do is incentivize local jurisdiction, and really a shout out to Missoula and to the county commissioners, Juanita Vera's here today, for the incredible work that they're doing across Missoula County to really deploy housing solutions. Thank you for your work. Um, but I would partner with our local jurisdictions and make sure that we're incentivizing the deployment of actual housing by, for example, one thing we can do is incentivize tax credits for streamlining the permitting process and making sure that projects aren't getting hung up where they can actually get rolled out and we can get our contractors and our folks to work on the ground. And then the third thing is child care. Um, the child tax credit is, it has, um, it has lapsed and it did not in, get included in the Inflation Reduction Act. So that is something that across this district I have talked with workers across this district for whom that would be a huge help. We need to help our working families so that you're not eating up an entire salary by paying for child care just to be able to go to work. So the child tax credit, affordable, affordable child care, and making sure that we have pre-K childhood education, I will partner with you to make sure that our federal government dollars are going to those kinds of resources so we can get things done. Thank you for the question. So affordable housing. It's important in Montana because people need a, need a place to live. But affordable housing, you look what's happening. Inflation is driving costs. So how, what's inflation? So you have energy costs. That's rises, plus excessive spending, and the Inflation Reduction Act is an oxymoron. It's going to cause more inflation. And then you have housing. So building permits are part of it. If you talk to the builders, they're having a tough time to get the permit. And I agree with this. This is where the federal government can introduce lower cost loans to incentivize building, but you've got to get the cost per unit down. In order to get the cost per unit down so people can afford it, you have to bring energy costs down. Then you have to bring inflation down. That means you need to curb spending. And you've got to fix our supply chain. It'd be really helpful if we could get back in the woods and actually cut a tree in Montana and have some supply uh, here. If we do that and we lower the interest rates, then people can actually afford a house or an apartment. OK. And Mr. Zinke, your time's up. Monica, do you want to? Just very quickly on the subject of affordable housing and who owns what here. Uh, what I have heard across this district, I heard this at the rodeo in Eureka, that we have to stop the VRBOs. So one of the things that we can look at for sure is these corporate entities who own second, third, and fourth homes in Montana. And I think that's really an important place to look in terms of what we can do to make sure that the people who own homes in Missoula are actually living in them and putting their kids in our schools. And I, I only have one home. It's here. And so I think that's certainly something we could work on. Yeah. <laughs> Sally here. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Nick Davis. I'm a longtime resident of uh, Montana's first congressional district. Um, our question is uh, private property rights and public access to public lands are both very important to Montanans. Um, those are two issues that come into conflict, uh, unfortunately, uh, quite often. 
where do you, or how, what would your approach be uh, in these instances when those two things come into conflict in general? And specifically, if you can address how you would handle the issue of the corner crossing, um, which I think probably most people understand what that is. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Zinke. You are absolutely right that public lands in Montana reigns high, if not, if not supreme. Uh, as secretary, I increased public access, hunting access, uh, as much as I could around the, the country and around Montana. So what are we going to do about an isolated piece of property that doesn't have access, but it's public property? And the corners sound like a great solution, but sometimes the corner is not the right place. Sometimes the corner is on the side of a hill. So if there's a fire on that section of public land, how do you get to it to put it out? Somewhere there's got to be an access. So I'm an access to public lands guy. I grew up right next to Glacier Park. Uh, we live in a place that, that we enjoy our public lands and our rivers. And so I do think there's a, there's a solution out there. It may not be the corner, per se, but we need to make sure that our public lands have reasonable access, and all of us have that opportunity to use them and live the Montana experience. And it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to be controversial, because you're going to have to work with the landowners, because property rights is meaningful. It's the basis of, a, of, of our law in many cases. Land law, and Monica will, well, I'm sure will, will, will reiterate this, land law and title is one of the oldest types of laws. So careful treading, but there's incentives uh, to make sure that, again, that public land should have public access. Okay. Ms. Chanel. Thanks, Ryan. And just to be clear, I'm pretty good at speaking for myself, so I'm happy to use my own voice here, and I'll be a good voice for Montana in Congress, too. So the question about private property rights and the conflict with public access. So this has really been something that is being pressurized and squeezed more recently when we're seeing the really huge purchase of giant swaths of land across Montana. And I have taken on some of the conglomerate um, out-of-state billionaire corporations who are aggregating Montana's small ranches. What we can't have are people like the Wilkes brothers buying private property around an entire public area of the Snowy Mountains and essentially ring-fencing them out so we can't even go there. That's wrong. So we need to figure out how to get access to those public lands that are being closed off to us. With respect to the question about corner crossings specifically, this is also an issue across the West. Wyoming is having a really heated battle about it right now. So this is an, is an area that does lend itself well to federal solutions. And we need to make sure, I think Ryan is correct, that sometimes that point of the corner connecting right there isn't necessarily the best place of access. So how are we going to work together to figure out when people purchase these uh, public lands or these private lands and effectively close out public access? How do we make sure that we can guarantee access? In Montana and the West, has this unique issue of checkerboard ownership. So much of these lands that have now fallen in that private people are buying up, they have those because of the checkerboard system that was put in place to enable the railroads to go across. So this is a part of our story. It's a part of our history. And I think working together, we can figure out how to make the corner crossings accessible. Um, when on our ranch, I just want to say, growing up, we allowed people to come and hunt on our land. And it's okay. now in Mr. block Nell, management, so up. public access is important to me. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Lamb. I also um, believe in public lands and the rights to access public lands very strongly. And I believe in personal property rights very strongly. It's, it's part of our founding of this country, property rights are. And, uh, but um, I, the, the closing off of these public lands, I believe we should have access to it. And um, they, uh, when, we're when we're talking about the corner properties, I, I know for hunting, uh, it gets very 
very um, hard here in some places when you have a, a corner property where, it's, where two other owners own the corners of it and you're not allowed to access that other side of the public lands. That that's something that should be addressed and I believe it should be opened up so someone can cross on that corner property to go hunting from one corner to the other through these public access, ac accesses. But public lands are very important to me and I believe our public lands should remain open. Yeah. Anyone want to do a rebuttal? No. No? You do? No? Okay. All right. Uh, we have time for one more question. So who have we got over there? Okay. Hi. Hi. My name is Carla Abrams. And this is the question that rose up uh, at our table. And this is for all the candidates. Do you agree we have a moral obligation to our youth to aggressively address the climate crisis? And if yes, how? Okay, Mr. No. Uh, thank you, Carla, for the question and the, for the work that you've done here in Missoula. Yes, and here's how. The energy transition is underway across the world. China has built 400 uh, million electric vehicles. And in the US, we are falling behind. We need to understand what the future actually holds and how we're going to get there. In Butte, I toured the industrial park and they are looking at a $1 billion green hydrogen investment at that park. That would be an incredible way to use some of the waste pot product in Butte, bring jobs, and transition to the new economy that lies ahead. Montana has tremendous natural resources, and we have a history of using our resources to make money for us and for the good of the country. Our wind is winter peaking, so transmission is an incredible way to serve the load on the west coast and use our wind to make money for Montana. So we can modernize the grid. We can increase transmission. We can end fossil fuel subsidies on public lands. And we can embrace the, the transition that lies ahead. Right now in Montana, we have $40 million allocated to building EV charging stations across the state. So that's going to be $10 million a year for four years. So we will normalize driving electric cars, which will be great because that will reduce the cost of driving and filling up our cars. So that is another way that I will look at um, moving into the new future that lies ahead. Uh, this is an incredible time of opportunity and the Inflation Reduction Act contains within it subsidies for putting solar on your rooftop, so tax credits. So people who are now in their homes can afford to get solar panels. So these okay. are great options. There's a Time's lot up. that lies ahead, and I'm excited okay. about this moment. Okay. Thank you. Well, if, if this is the new economy, I don't think we want any part of it. So let's look at energy. Environmentally, it is better to produce energy in this country under our regulation than to watch it get produced overseas with no regulation. Undisputed. Russia is 41% dirtier. If you don't believe me, I'll take you on a tour of the Middle East and Africa, how not to produce energy. American energy, all the above, does things better, more efficiently, by far. Secondly, I spent most of my life fighting overseas for someone else's energy. And believe me, I've seen things that I don't want your daughters, your sons, or you ever to see. So not sending troops overseas to fight for someone else's energy is morally correct and manufacturing. You talk about manufacturing, talk about supply chain. Well, what are the components of manufacturing? You gotta have affordable, reliable energy. And that energy, at least next 50 years, is fossil fuels. So those that think that, well, we're gonna, we're gonna somehow have batteries be this great nirvana. So what are you gonna do with the batteries? On solar cells, and I'm all the above, but we better figure out how to how to process used batteries. 90% of the solar cells goes right into, into landfills. 90%. That's toxic metals, heavy metals, right now. 90% of the solar cells, when they, when they come out, they're not being recycled, they go right into landfills. Mercury, and what are we gonna do about the batteries? What are you gonna do about that? So to keep it in the ground will make our economy exactly what we're feeling. 
When energy prices rise, guess what? The world doesn't, doesn't convert. Yeah, China's building EV. Sure they are. They're also building a heck of a lot of coal. And when energy prices rise, you know what happens in Africa? They start burning trees and coal and anything they can. Okay, Mr. Zinke, your time's up. Energy matters. Mr. Lamb. The government, again, is not the answer to these things. More federal regulations do not fix these issues. And uh, the EPA, the DEQ, and all these other agencies that are involved, um, they're not, they're, they, they compound the issue. And it's, it goes back to the local level, the local government. We need, we need local communities to get involved and fix these issues and not the federal government. Okay, rebuttal. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So let's just be clear, in 2015, you made a vote that made our commodities uh, subject to the global market, which has directly uh, resulted in the rise of gas prices for us. And this was all for your energy clients, from whom you've taken at least $500,000 in the last year or so. So let's be clear. We serve the interests of those who pay us to do their work. 70% of my campaign money comes from Montana. Only 6% of Ryan Zinke's money comes from Montana. But with respect to the energy issues, we can't be subject to the whims of dictators across the world. That has led to the war in Ukraine. That's led to the terrible things of the dictators in Saudi Arabia. We can be truly energy independent. We can be independent and develop, build, and distribute our energy here in Montana. We have incredible, unique resources here. And I want to build those, use those, and develop energy independence for all of us, because that's what matters. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Zinke. Truth matters, doesn't it? So when, says, when someone says something that's blatantly dishonest, it's called a lie in Montana, all right? So let's just focus on, on the truth. The truth of the matter is energy plus spending drives inflation. And for the average Montana family, that's about $500 a month you don't have. The average family goes up and tries to buy groceries. They make choices now. When the average family fills up the car, they have to make choices because we drive big trucks here and we like it. A lot of trucks have hunting racks and we like that too. So when you look at where we are in the economy and how to get out of the mess we're in, number one, we've got to curb the spending. That means we've got to curb the spending. You can't have an Inflation Reduction Act that will, will drive up, up costs, as it will. It doesn't do much except it's a wish list for, for the, the climate change people. And okay. I agree Time's with, up. with, Mr. with climate but I don't agree with, with mortgaging our banks and our future children okay. because of, to do it. Uh, Mr. Lamb, would you like to? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that concludes the Q&A. Uh, I'm sure there are 5,000 more questions that we could all ask them, but uh, we don't have time for that. We do have time for closing statements. Uh, each candidate will get one minute, and we'll start with Mr. Lamb. It's, it's been an honor to be here today, to be a part of this. Um, Form. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, listening to us up here and listening to our side. There's always a, um, a third choice. There's a libertarian choice. <laughs> so think of uh, me at the ballot. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate everyone coming, but I want to give a little ray of optimism too. Uh, we're all Americans and we're all Montanans. And there are issues we're going to agree or disagree on, but we shouldn't be disagreeable. And let's, let's work on making Montana a better place for us all. And we have challenges. Uh, I'm a Reagan optimist. The glass is half full. I understand we have issues in this country. And everyone in this room does too. But there isn't an issue that I see that we can't fix. It's not within the measure and the spirit of America and Montana to fix it. And mostly I am looking at Let's look at D.C. in terms of what it is. They don't understand Montana, but we have to also stand and defend and defund because it's our lifestyle here. We have to defend what we think is important. 
And what we think important in Montana, and I've been doing this as a state senator and your congressman elected twice and in interior, is what's important in Montana. Okay, it's time's us. up. Time's so up. thank you. I appreciate your support. Thank you, City Club. Thank you, all of you, for being here today. And thank you, Ryan Zinke and John Lamb, for showing up. I hope you will join us. Uh, John and I have agreed to uh, more of these debates in every county, and I hope you'll join us, Ryan. This is what the people of this Western District need to hear. So thank you for being here. This is my home. I have lived here and worked here and been representing and working with you by your side in this district for the last 25 years. Since the primary, I haven't been anywhere but Montana. I've been traveling up and down this district, meeting with you, talking to you, hearing what it is you care about and what you want in your representative. I'm the sixth of 10 kids. I rode in the middle of our Olympic eight. I know the value and the power of the middle. And having been left behind on family trips, I know how easy it is to overlook the middle. But it's where our strength lies. It's the working class. It's the people that we live next door to, where we go trick-or-treating, where we ride our bikes, and Time's we watch up. each other's kids. Time's up. That's who I am, that's what I'm for. I'm for you, and I hope you'll be for me. Thank you. John Lamb, Monica Trinnell, Ryan Zinke. Thank you so much for making yourselves available today for this very important event. Um, ballots go out in October. Please vote, everybody. And thank you to our sponsors and to you, our audience, with whom we would not be able to do this, and this wouldn't matter very much at all. Um, and thank you, to uh, again, to the University of Montana, First Security Bank, and Blackfoot Communications. Uh, please join us next month, September 19th. Our next forum will focus on how policy discussions in Helena may impact local public education. Please check our Facebook page and website later this week for more information on that front. And again, thanks to all. Thanks, Fred. Thank you.